Welcome to Global One Media Stocks to Watch. I'm Michael Suido. I'm speaking today with Julio Bonifacio. He's the executive chairman of Alta Copper, which is focused on a huge project in Peru. Julio, great to uh, speak with you again. Welcome back. Welcome back to the show. Well, thank you very much for having us back, Michael. Very much appreciate it. Now, not too long ago, you were in Toronto for the annual Prospectors and Developers Convention. And while you were there, you met with a number of top Peruvian officials to update them on your project which is up in the Andes Mountains and home to one of the world's largest undeveloped high-grade copper deposits. Mining plays a big, big role in Peru's economy. It accounts for about 10% of the country's tax revenues, more than 8% of GDP. That's according to Ernst & Young. So tell us, based on your work there, how is Peru's government promoting the development of the mining industry? Well, I mean, there's been a, a, a recent change afoot uh, over the last number of months and Clearly, when you look at the number of multi-billion dollar projects in Peru, you look at the opportunity that's created by way of mining in Peru, I think it's been clearly demonstrated to, to the current government that um, what they need to do is streamline the permitting and regulatory process. And so they've been very clear in their messaging. There's many, many publications, articles that's, that have gone out that, that speak to that, to that end. We were uh, blessed to have a meeting with the Ministry of Mines, uh, newly appointed Romo Mucho. Um, clearly, in in that private offsite meeting, it was very very clear that um, you know they want to facilitate the process for companies like ours. And uh, uh, Romulo Mucho is also very familiar with the project, so I think we benefit from that. He understands the location, the Lambiaca province, appreciates that these are projects that need to be developed. And there's been many many recent um, approvals granted. Most recently, um, in the last number of months, uh, Sanas has provided approval to Safinal's project, the tech project. Uh, and so things are things are changing for the positive, and um, I think if anything, that's going to facilitate what we where what, what we're endeavoring to do on the drill permit. We've made an application; we expect to get approval on that uh, in the near term, and uh, as well for us to continue to move forward with the regulatory and permitting process over the coming months. Excellent. We'll talk a bit more about those permits in just a bit, but I want to, re want to uh, return to Toronto for a moment. The list of officials you met there is pretty impressive. You got to speak with the country's Minister of Economy and Finance, the Peruvian Ambassador to Canada, several top mining officials, including the Minister of Energy and Mines, as well as a senior sustainability officer. And you also joined a private roundtable with Peru's central bank chairman. Uh, this access speaks to, I would say, both the importance of Alta Copper's project, as well as mining in general to the Peruvian government. So I'm curious, when you briefed these officials about your project up in Canariaco, up in the Andes, what was the reaction? Were there any specific outcomes that you can share with us? Well, I think, you know, first and foremost, um, you know, if you look at the history of the company, um, the project's been rel relatively inactive until until about last year. And so I think they're very pleased to see that we're, we're back at work. Um, I think they were very pleased to see that we've got a, a big supportive shareholder in Fortescue Metals that owns approximately 30%. And that, you know, last year in itself, we were able to bring in uh, a good amount of funding to develop the asset and move forward with the project. And so, and I will say all, all the funding that was brought in in 2023 was done at a significant premium to market. So as with all projects, you need capital, but, you know, having supportive strategic shareholders help you. Um, this is a project that, that many view as literally one that can be brought into production, you know, in the next five to seven years. No, of course, subject to execution at, at various levels, but, um, you know, large, large copper projects like this, there's not many. And when you've got one that's this far along uh, the development curve, um, clearly this is something of interest to the Peruvian regulatory officials. So their outcome, sorry, their uh, reaction to what you share with them, it sounds like it was definitely positive. Oh, extremely positive, extremely positive. I and mean, it, it, you know, really does get back to projects of merit, you know, identify projects of merit. And they've identified this one as a project that, that looks to be next up, if you will. You know, clearly we have to go through a process, but it's, um, you know, in any cycle from exploration development to construction, you're, you're talking about a 20 year timeline. We're well into that timeline. You know, we're not 20 years away by any stretch of the imagination. So that's, that's kind of a key point. And that's also why, um, we're garnering a lot of attention from from separate groups so above and beyond um, our, our existing large shareholder. But I like that phrase. Out, uh, well received. They put out uh, on their own um, a publication that listed uh, all the copper and the fact that they met with us and um, you know spoke highly of the company and and uh, what it ultimately represents. 
I really like that phrase, project of merit. I think that's a really good one to keep in mind. And like you say, the, uh, the time frame for these projects is extensive, and you guys are already quite a ways into it. When we uh, look at Peru, they're the world's second largest producer of copper after Chile. And regular viewers have heard me say this before, but copper is a hot, hot commodity. It's used in electric vehicles, solar panels, wind turbines, and well, just about anything digital or electric. It's currently trading close to its highest price in more than a year. And top Wall Street analysts at places like Bank of America and Citigroup believe that rising demand and supply constraints will push copper prices even higher. So let's take a closer look at your projects now. Canariaco, like we said, is up in the Andes. It's about uh, six hours from the coast of Peru. How's the exploration proceeding? What's the latest there? Well, currently, um, the first critical catalyst that's going to be coming out would be this up updated optimize preliminary economic assessment that, that is rather advanced. It's been built on the back of several past studies, inclusive of a pre-feasibility study. However, for us to get back in and commence the exploration activity, which is going to consist of a, a 10,000 meter drilling program, we need to receive approval on our DIA uh, drill permit application. And that, in fact, was discussed and we've had very advanced meetings with the various regulators on that. So we anticipate getting that sometime in Q2. Um, our drilling program, per se, we're not looking at commencing that until Q3, Q4. Uh, ideally, Q3, but you know, it really gets back to timelines on on approvals. But um, the various meetings that we've had, both both during PDAC and subsequent, uh, things are prog progressing quite nicely. So currently targeting Q2 and starting on an exploration drilling program of a, consisting of about 10,000 meters, um, you know, depending on where, where we sit with the uh, actual final approval sometime in Q3, Q4. Um, but again, going back one step, um, the major focus right now is this, this study that's going to come out. It will be rather advanced, and I think it'll speak uh, very clearly to the the magnitude, the size of the project, and what it ultimately represents. It'll be more based on higher throughput on a day to day basis, but also that equates to significantly higher annual copper production, which you know, respectively. Uh, does improve the economics in, in a very significant way. And I would add that the previous economics we put out are very, very robust, but um, the, what is coming, I think, takes a slightly different view on how the project could be built. And I think it'll be uh, viewed in a, in a very, very favorable fashion. All right, well, we'll look forward to that. I can't wait to read it and uh, to learn more about it. Uh, so that's mainly Canaraco Norte. You have two projects south of that. There's Canaraco Sur and Quebrada Verde. Uh, give us a quick overview. How important might these deposits be to Peru? Well, I mean, typically, um, peripheries come in clusters, and, and we've identified Norte. Um, it's still got good open extent, both laterally and at depth. And if you look at some of the historical drilling, and, and I would add, you know, many of the viewers know this already, but it was last drilled in 2013. Cumulative drilling to date, 85,000 meters. So by any measure, comparison to other periphery systems, that's pretty modest, and it speaks volumes of the success we've had on the exploration front, if you will. Going back in and, and, and drilling areas that were bottomed in mineralization, focusing on some of the higher grade areas with the North Table will be key. Ken Eric Closer is interesting in that, you know, with a modest amount of drilling, 15 drill wells, we've already, you know, put in place a resource of north of 2 billion pounds of copper, gold, silver, and molly. Uh, that, that's got good open extent. Verity has had no drilling, has all similar geological signatures. So, uh, we're pretty excited about what it represents. Now, I would add that, you know, we're already sitting on a very large resource, you know, copper, copper equivalent, you know, north of uh, 16 billion pounds of copper. But any level of success that we have with SIR or Verity to simply improve the overall dynamics of this project. It's really about a generational resource. Can we actually continue to grow it, increase it? We strongly believe we can. We've taken the, the data, you know, we've applied 3D modeling to it. And we've come up with a number of a number of high high priority targets. So very uh, systematic process, if you will, looking at the data and, and coming back with some clear opportunities. Both uh, well, not both, but you know, inclusive Norte, Sur, and Verde. So pretty excited about what it represents. But you know, I don't want that to sway away from folks thinking that the economics that we put out here in the next number of weeks is, is going to be anything but uh, you know very very significant. Um, but it'll be sort of the the starting point to what ultimately occurs, you know, both by way of, you know, the study would be the baseline for the various discussions we'll have with certain groups from a funding perspective, inclusive of our large shareholder, um, moving forward with 
community agreement, we believe is, 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 is advancing nicely um, with what we've done recently over the last 12, 12 to 15 months. And then also starting in on a drill program, which, which also benefits the community because we employ a lot of the community members. So it, it's got a sort of a two pronged benefit. You know, firstly, we know the resource is going to get bigger because it's pretty obvious to us with all the modeling that we've done. Um, but secondly, it also allows us to re, not, not re-engage. We've already engaged with the community, but, but you know, employ a number of those individuals. And at the end of the day, it's demonstrating to the community that, uh, you know, we are stakeholders and we're sharing the benefit of the project with them and, and working alongside with them. And also, if I could add, you know, adding and helping them with certain other businesses that they may want to start to move towards but uh, being a responsible community member stakeholder is a very key part of this but uh, yeah the drilling program in itself has you know as i noted two separate benefits um and i think that's kind of a key point as well getting back in showing our activity um benefiting the community as well by way of you know the income generation that they'll create for the work that they do for us Definitely a lot going on. You mentioned that drill permit application, the economic assessment, uh, your work in the community. Uh, I'd actually love to hear a bit more about what you're doing in the business development there, but we'll save that for another conversation. Uh, right now, I'd like to turn to the, the investment side of the equation, uh, starting with an article I saw on a site called Simply Wall Street. So they ran a piece about Alta Copper recently in which they questioned your company's cash reserves. Their analysts say you have about one year's worth of cash in the bank, so you'll either need to raise fresh funds or generate revenue before that. Is this accurate? And if so, what are your plans? Well, I'm kind of smiling because that, that's 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 borderline silly. Um, any development company, exploration development company, needs capital because they don't generate revenues. You're not going to generate revenues until you have a producing mine. So the mere fact that they commented on that is it's kind of I'm using, and I will say that very directly. Um, we have raised capital last year. We raised close to $10 million at a premium to market, 30 to 40% premium to market. Never had an issue raising capital on projects of merit. This is a significant project. It's it's more a function of valuation. Um, that's the reason for raising money at a premium, not at a discount, not at market price. And so we have many, many opportunities on that end. That's never going to be an issue. Um, again, if you look at the copper complex, you look at copper price, you look at what's driving it, which is really more of a structural deficit in copper. The EV thematic clearly is another demand and push on, on the demand for copper, but it's really about a structural deficit in copper more than anything else. And if you look at various projections, some folks think that copper will trade up to ten to $12,000 a ton, which is the equivalent of about 6 to $7, 5 to $6, excuse me. Um, so projects of merit, projects of this nature, the fact that the world needs copper um, are all key points. So the suggestion that uh, we have one year of cash reserves, um, as you can see by my expression, is frankly amusing. Of course, we're going to need capital, but we'll do it right and do it smart. We have lots of opportunities. And you know, at the end of the day, it's about the asset itself and the fact that it is a project of merit of great interest. Now, to, to further that comment, any other business sector that is not in or generating revenue obviously seeks capital. That includes many other sectors, technology, AI, um, mm -hmm. biomed. Um, and so I'm a bit, again, amused by that comment. I'm gonna be very direct about that. I'd love to see the piece, um, but right, you know, rest assured myself as a very large shareholder and I, I will continue to grow my position. Uh, I'm not concerned about that. I'm gonna do whatever makes sense that benefits all stakeholders, all shareholders, and raising capital and how we go about it. Um, you know, that'll be done, I think, in a very smart, eloquent way. And you'll see that we'll get the capital we need. Now, with that said, and one of the reasons that I stepped into um, what was then called Pedente Copper, we've done a name change and share consolidation to, to get ourselves ready for where we currently are. And this year is going to be very exciting with the number of catalysts that, that come forth, starting with that updated study. Part of the reason was that in all projects from exploration to development, the amount of capital that's required proves to be and can prove to be a dilution exercise. What interested me with this project was, of course, it was care and maintenance for a number of years due to the downturn in copper prices. That's all changed. But to replicate the work that's been done, the resource, the drilling, the studies, the relationships forged, um, 
you know, a 20 year existence in that part of the world, that would cost you close to $150 million US. So treat those as sunk costs that we don't have to incur and realize that the amount of money that we need to bring in is going to be relatively modest to get to where we need to get to. And it's all about value appreciation. And so it's not like I have to go and spend another $150 million US. I don't. I've already got that in hand. I've got a, a body of work. I've got a resource. I've got a study that's coming out, previous studies that all support valuation. Now, the other clear benefit is the the, the copper market is changing and it's changing for all the right reasons. And anyone that, that understands the market closely enough will appreciate that, hey, we knew it was going to go into deficit. It is. There's been you know large shutdowns worldwide, Cobra Panama. We also know that the EV thematic decarbonization is, is, is real. Now, my view on that is it takes a bit longer. It will take a bit longer, but that's going to create an added layer of demand. And so prognosis for copper looks fantastic. And then you have to realize that there's just not enough of it on the planet. So which projects will garner attention? More projects like this will. And so I think that's that's also a key point. So then you, you circle back and then you go, well, okay, surely he can raise capital and the valuations will change based on execution on the project. If you execute at the project level, which we have done and will continue to do, it'll be very, very evident in 2024 that we've done that. That'll derive the opportunity to raise amounts of capital. But again, clear, clear point here. I do not need to raise significant amounts of capital. So from a dilution perspective, it's about maintaining the integrity of the asset, minimizing dilution to the net benefit of all the existing shareholders. And that's the clear objective. And, you know, myself as a large shareholder, I have that, you know, first first in mind. And Joanne Fries, who's the founder of the company, um, she's a large shareholder as well. We have many groups that have stepped in over the last number of years. And so, you know, doing what's right for all stakeholders is a key point. Those are great points. And uh, I think it's really interesting you point out, you highlight the last time you raised capital, it was at a premium. People were essentially paying more than market value for it. Uh, that, of course, you're going to raise capital at some point, but you don't have to do it. You're not cash strapped by any stretch of the imagination. And, and the market, like you say, it, it is definitely a good time. Speaking of the market, last time we spoke was in late February. And since then, your share price, Alta Copper share price, has rallied. It's up more than 30% since the beginning of the year. It's actually performing even better than spot prices for copper during that same period. So here we go. Tell us, why do you think Alta Copper is a good investment? Why should retail and institutional investors take a fresh look at it? Um, I think that, you know, the biggest key point on that, Michael, is the fact that we're re-engaged and it's really about looking at, at, at the project, looking at the company and, and doing what we need to do to de-risk the project further. So this study is a key point that, that people are, I think, going to pay attention to. Um, Re-engaging with the community, as we have over the last uh, 12 to 15 months, opening up community offices and and showing that we're an active member, and and really presenting the opportunity to other investors. So when you look at this project and you compare it to many others, and you know of course some of those other companies have been more active, but if you did a side by side comp review, you'd see that uh, we're grossly undervalued, but we have much upside in front of us. And you know the mere fact that um, it's kind of a key point that that gets overlooked. We have a, a $60 billion company that owns 30%. This is a company that some investors don't even know who they are, which is odd to me, yet it's bigger than American, it's not American Barrick, but it used to be called that years back. It's bigger than Barrick, it's bigger than Agnico, it's bigger than Newmont. Um, yet certain mining investors, to my chagrin, don't know who they are. Clearly they're involved for a reason, they have executed on multi multi billion dollar projects look at our board of directors look at who they put on the board two individuals uh, they've got a keen interest in moving towards the critical metal space and copper specific um that that should speak volumes and so you know these things all lead to why this is a a very compelling investment and at the end of the day i would add further that you know, I've got a background that, that starts from exploration development to construction. I understand every aspect of, of what gets done from precious metal companies to base metal companies. I've been involved in two previous copper companies that, that have done reasonably well. Um, I've been allowed to step into this one because I've known Joanne for a number of years and she asked if I could work with her and see how we could advance the asset. And so, um, and again, it was because I was initially a, a large enough investor before I stepped on. But at the end of the day, there's very few opportunities like this that exist. And if you get past the, the discount factor approval, and you should, you simply need to look at the clippings. You need to look at the fact that we get an audience with the mines minister, um, we're well-received in Peru, and we're active again. Those all point to why 
this is a really compelling opportunity and people should look at it from that standpoint. If our valuation is at a discount, is there an opportunity for an ultra copper to, you know, it's currently trading, I think at 45 to 50 cents per share, modest market cap of close to 45 to 50 million. Is there an opportunity for the valuation to go up by five to 10 times? And the question is yes. Now you look at some of these other projects, they're already fully valued. It's already baked in. They have smaller projects. The economics don't compare. Our economics will come out very clearly that we're at a certain threshold. The resource speaks for itself. Again, hasn't been drilled since 2013. There's so many different things that you can look at on this asset. And so, you know, to, to be very direct on this comment, does the share price go lower? It'll trade. Certain people will take a profit because it's gone up 30%. It's not about a 30% profit. It's about how we execute in 2024, how we move forward with a transaction that adds value. That we, as in when we do that, the values change. But the opportunity for an alpha copper to go up by five to 10 times is very, very real. Simply do the math, 16 billion pounds. And most of those pounds are measured and indicated. So 70, uh, you know, National Instrument 43101 compliant resource has been vetted numerous times. You have to actually go through that process each and every time you do a study. So, you know, there's many, many attributes to the project. If you like the size of the asset and you know that there's good upside from a blue sky potential, that's one reason why you should buy into Alta Copper. If you like the fact that it's far enough advanced on the development curve, and you have to look at the Lasan development curve and, you know, when values peak, we're at the, we're at the crest of the top. Now, what do we do in the next six months is kind of the key point. But, you know, when I circle back on things like, hey, I don't have to spend $150 million US to get here. I've already got enough in front of me, but I've got more that I can add to it by way of systematically going through a process, both by way of the study work, ensuring that it's advanced for purposes of the various discussions we'll have, moving forward with the community, opening up community offices, working with the stakeholders appropriately. And that's a, a, a discussion for a later date. But doing all the different things that I've kind of noted in our call today, all derive why it's a very compelling investment opportunity. It's not really about the downside, it's about the upside. So that's how I look at it. I am a large shareholder. I've said that numerous times. I will continue to add my position. I cannot currently add to my position because we're coming up with material news, but you know, rest assured I will continue to do so. And it really gets back to the fact that we're trading at a huge discount. I'm going to bridge that gap with the team. Uh, we've added folks to our team um, and, you know, very happy with, you know, the people we have. And it does take a, it does take a team to advance these things, but we've got a great team in Peru. We've got a fantastic team in Vancouver. We're modest in terms of our, you know, head count. We keep our costs down. Um, and, you know, have we raised capital at a premium during what has been a very challenging market in 2023? The answer is yes. So, you know, to close off on that point, that is never going to be an issue, as I've demonstrated. And you can look at my past history on funding and the ability to do so. Um, but it really is about the investment opportunity here and the fact that I think it's a, a very compelling you know, situation. And based on what we see, I, I, I remain very, very optimistic. And I'm very optimistic that we can execute on all fronts. The naysayers that speak about the community, that speak about the arsenic, they really don't know what they're talking about. At the end of the day, to be very clear, you know, the naysayers in the community will execute on that. Um, people made reference, I, I'm going to take the opportunity to touch on this. People have made reference to a protest in 2012, but they seem to have forgotten that we entered into a community agreement shortly thereafter. However, the soundbite was the community protest, but that was in 2012. Many, many things have changed for the positive. Um, people make mention of arsenic, but they don't do their homework and realize that some of the biggest projects in the world carry as much, if not more, arsenic. And the amount of arsenic that we carry life of mine is about a percent. Do we have a saleable copper concentrate? The answer is yes. Are we going to put out a study that reflects that we have a saleable copper concentrate? Of course we are. So, you know, those two sound bites that have come back to me since I've stepped into the company, um, I quite frankly, again, will say directly, pretty amused by that. It's about execution. We're going to show that we can. The study is going to clearly demonstrate we have a saleable copper concentrate. We've got a project that generates an annual amount of copper production, gold and silver, that's very, very significant, enough to move the needle for very significant companies. And that's arguably why you have a $60 billion company that owns 30% of us. So what does that represent? How do we create value? How do we create a multiple? That will occur over a period of time. And, you know, working through the, the legacy shareholders of Cadente Copper that 
don't unfortunately don't appreciate the value proposition. That's really part of the process here. And that's likely why we've moved up in, in value. And I think we will continue to do so with, you know, project related news and um, backstop by transactions that support why we should be trading at a significantly higher value. I mean, I, I'm struck by your passion about how you know the business inside and out, uh, and also by how you think that the company could go up five to 10 times, because right now you say it is significantly undervalued. So definitely things that- uh, I got to close off on this, and sorry for the interruption, but yeah, no, thank you for that. But I mean, I say five to 10 times, and even if I get to two to three times to four times, that shows you why it's a fantastic opportunity, right? I mean, we definitely we all set targets for ourselves. I, I, I'm pretty- Focused in on valuation from an NPV perspective, PNAV, discounts, we could talk about comps, we could talk about how people do these things. Um, we match up nicely. And, you know, if we execute on, on each of those fronts, um, you know, every single instance that we execute will drive a higher value point for us on, on a go forward basis. And you also touched on the demand for copper. It's a cornerstone of anything electric. It's a key key component of the transition to green economies. So really interesting to hear about your progress, about your meetings with Bruce leaders. Thank you so much for these updates. Thank you, Michael. Very much appreciate the time taken today. You've been speaking with Alta Copper Executive Chairman, Julio Bonifacio, and you've been watching Global One Media Stocks to Watch. I'm Michael Suedo. 